Let's take a quick moment to look at Preferences inside of Photoshop CS6. On a Mac, you'll find it under the Photoshop menu and choosing Preferences General. On a PC, it's under the Edit menu. The shortcut is Command-K or Control-K. Now there are a lot of preferences depending upon your version of Photoshop, and I'd like to just talk through a few of the most essential. I always use the Adobe Color Picker. This color picker is going to be the built-in one that all Adobe apps use, and it's very versatile. Choose this over the Apple or Windows System Picker. For image interpolation, stick with the Automatic option. This will automatically choose the best by cubic method for enlarging or reducing an image. Moving down through some of the options, I tend to uncheck the Use Shift key for Tool Switch preference. This will go ahead and allow you to cycle through keyboard shortcuts more quickly for the Tools panel. If you have the scroll wheel mouse, you might choose to use this option for zooming. I tend to also use a history log and embed it into the metadata of the image. This shows me what's happened with the images as I make changes. The next category is Interface. You can click the word Interface or the Next button. Here you have several choices for color. I like the newer option here for the dark, rich gray, but you may choose other shades depending upon your personal preference. I find the darker gray, however, cuts down on wear and tear on the eyes. Beyond this, you can go through and take a look at some of the choices for the different screen modes. I'll generally stay with the default options, and then for full screen mode, go with a dark gray. As you move through, take advantage of things like tooltips to go ahead and see rollover shortcuts that describe either the keyboard shortcut or a more accurate description in plain language to give you an idea of how to use each command or tool. Do not check Show Channels in Color. It'll get in the way. However, I'll generally bump up the user interface font size to medium or large. That will make it easier to see things when you are viewing panels. However, you'll need to restart Photoshop in order to take advantage of the change in size. Let's click Next. For file handling, I always save an image preview and I also save the file extension. If you'd like smaller images, you could turn that off or prompt it to ask when saving. This will make a smaller file, but makes it more difficult when browsing at the system level to find the image you want. You'll also notice that we have the ability to do autosave, and this will create a backup version automatically at the set interval. I generally will do a five minute interval, and what's nice about this is it doesn't write over the image, but it does create backup data in case you crash and need to restore. I generally will use the Adobe Camera Raw to use for supported raw file types. You'll also notice the ability to say if you want layered TIFF files. I'll generally uncheck this box because I do prefer layered TIFF. It's an alternative to Photoshop and produces smaller file size. Let's click Next. The Performance category adjusts Photoshop to run well on different systems. You'll notice, depending upon how much RAM you have installed in your system, that Photoshop will generally ask for up to about 70% to be allocated for the app. It will dynamically update, though, based on the task at hand and how many other apps you have running. You'll also see the history and cache, and this will include how the images behave when opened and how responsive they are. I generally go with the default option. Scratch disks allow you to identify a separate disk to handle extra information when dealing with large files. Using your internal backup drive is generally a bad idea, so I will instead choose another drive that's attached to my system. If I have an internal drive, that's ideal. If not, I'll choose a drive that's connected to a fast connection type. Firewire, Thunderbolt, USB 3, etc. And this will allow you to specify which one is a scratch disk. If you have a supported graphics card, it'll detect it, and this will accelerate many of the tasks you be... This will accelerate performance using OpenCL or CUDA. 
Let's go to the next category, and there's a lot of changes I like for cursors. When painting, I prefer to see the crosshair in my brush. This makes it easier to see the center of the brush stroke. I also will tell it to show me a precise cursor for sampling. I don't need to see the cute eyedropper. I'd rather see a precise target to know where I'm clicking. The next category is transparency, and I generally leave this alone. However, you can adjust the size of the transparency grid as well as its color. Units and rulers allow you to specify how you want things to behave. If you're doing a lot of print work, inches is generally used. However, if you're designing screen graphics, you might find pixels to be most useful, or perhaps percent. Column size is going to deal with other text layout, and I'm not worried about that too often. But I will generally adjust my new document preset resolutions. Screen resolution is often set at 72, however you can adjust that to 96, which is another common number. 300 is typically what's used for print. Some people will drop this down to 200, or even 150 if dealing with newspapers. Our next option is Guides, Grid, and Slices. This allows you to assign what colors the guides are for overlays. I generally prefer my guides to be red. I find that it stands out a bit easier. For slices, these are typically used for web graphics. However, they're easy to accidentally turn on. I'll turn off Show Slice Numbers and usually set the slices to a light gray so they don't get in my way. The next category is plugins. This allows you to choose another folder for booting. For example, if you move from machine to machine, some manufacturers will allow you to install plugins on a thumb drive. Under the filter menu, you could choose to see all the gallery effects filters, and this will put them into the filter menu. Otherwise, they are hidden and the filter menu will be less cluttered. This is really a matter of personal preference. I leave it unchecked because I don't rely on filters too much, but you might turn that on if you'd like to have more direct access. Our type category allows you some very important options. For example, you could choose to use smart quotes, so when you press the foot and inches key on the keyboard, you get apostrophes or single or double quotation marks. For the text engine, you could specify if you're using other text fonts such as East Asian or Middle Eastern. For most users, this is not a big deal, but this can come in handy. Our final category is only available if you're using Photoshop Extended, and this allows you access to lots of controls for 3D use, including the ability to use the video RAM for 3D drawing to speed that up and to adjust how the ground plane and other interactive rendering controls behave. When you're done, you can click OK to apply the preferences. Now, preferences are very much a matter of personal choice, so the recommendations I walked you through are just that, recommendations. You may find as you use Photoshop, you'll make changes or adjustments based on your personal choice.